This is a short video on chemotherapeutic agents. We have a few f scattered pictures and diagrams here to start. On the left, we have vinca alkaloids and taxanes, which are two classes that affect microtubules. We'll talk about how those affect microtubules and, and the action of killing cancer. We have in the middle the two topo isomerase inhibitors, and we're going to talk about how those can lead to cell death as long as well as a couple examples of those. And on the right here, we have a general graph that shows how it, when we use chemotherapeutic agents, we want to ensure that they kill cancer cells better than they kill normal cells. So we're going to jump right into talking about the classes of these chemical agents used in the treatment of cancer. This is chemotherapeutic agents. We're going to start with alkylating agents first. This is the first class we're going to be talking about. Now, alkylating agents in general attach alkyl groups to DNA. They usually attach groups between two base pairs, allowing for cross-linking of base pairs. This, of course, damages the DNA, makes you unable to replicate it, and it kills the cell that way. Now, the good thing about alkylating agents is that they're, they are not specific to any part of the cell cycle, so they should be working on all cells regardless of what part of the cell cycle they're in. We have some common typical alkylating agents here. We have typical and atypical alkylating agents. We're going to start talking about the typical ones. The two that are, that are important to know are cyclophosphamide and ifosphamide. Now, there's a whole list of side effects with these, and a lot of them are the ones that you might classically think of as side effects to chemotherapy. We have myelosuppression, which means a drop in white blood cells, a drop in hemoglobin, and a drop in the crits. We have nausea and vomiting. That's the big one. Everybody's scared of nausea and vomiting when getting chemo. We have secondary malignancies, we have infertility, and hemorrhagic cystitis, which is a uh, problem with the kidneys. You get blood in the urine and you have pain with urination. Um, it's caused by the irritation of the bladder from the acrolein metabolite. Now we have atypical alkylating agents as well. We're going to start off by talking about the platinum compounds. These work by covalently binding purine DNA bases. We're going to talk about three of these. First we have cisplatin which has side effects of nephrotoxicity and nausea and vomiting. This is actually the strongest inducer of nausea and vomiting that we're going to be talking about today. It's extremely potent, potent and it, it almost certainly causes vomiting in a patient if you don't give them any medication for, for vomiting when you're administering cisplatin. We have carboplatin, which causes platelet problems. And we have oxaliplatin, which causes cold sensitivity. And it's worth mentioning that all of these platinum compounds also cause peripheral neuropathies, or like a like the pins and needles tingling in your in your fingers and fingers and toes. Next group of atypical alkylating agents are the nitrosoureas. Now these are two acronyms: BCNU, CCNU. The actual names for these drugs have mus in them, M-U-S, like carmustine. It's because they are related to mustard gas that was used during one of the world wars. So it's easy to remember that these, which are related to mustard gas, if you look up the full names of them, cause pulmonary toxicity. And it's also worth mentioning that they also cause phlebitis and central nervous system problems. So these are the alkylating agents. Next, we're going to talk about anti-metabolites. We also have three categories of these, but first, anti-metabolites inhibit DNA replication by mimicking normal cell compounds. And because these are inhibiting DNA replication, they're specific to cells that are in the S phase because you undergo DNA replica replication in the S phase. First group we're going to talk about is folate inhibitors, and the big one here is methotrexate, very commonly used drug. It inhibits dihydrofolate reductase, which is an enzyme that prevents the regeneration of tetrahydrofolate, and it inhibits the conversion of folate, which is a dietary supplement, something that we get from our food, into tetrahydrofolate. When we administer methotrexate, we always want to do it with leucovorin. Leucovorin is an adjuvant that protects the healthy cells. It actually gives the healthy cells another method of getting folate, another method of using folate. And uh, methotrexate and leucovorin go together for that reason. Side effect of methotrexate is mucositis and myelosuppression. Myelosuppression is going to come up quite a bit. Next group of anti-metabolites are the pyrimidine inhibitors big one here is 5-FU, 5-fluorouracil, which inhibits the enzyme thymidylate synthetase. When you administer 5-FU as a bolus, it's going to cause myelosuppression. If you administer it in a continual dose, it's going to cause GI problems like diarrhea, mucositis. So the side effects of 5-FU depend on how you administer it.
You also want to use Lucavorin with 5-FU for a different reason this time. This time, Lucavorin helps the mechanism of action of 5-FU. When you use methotrexate and Lucavorin, Lucavorin protects the healthy cells. When you use 5-FU and Lucavorin, Lucavorin potentiates the mechanism of action of 5-FU. It's worth noting the difference of Lucavorin between its use in methotrexate and 5-fluorouracil. Cape cytobine is essentially an oral prodrug for 5-FU. Now, 5-FU normally is not administered orally. Cape cytobine is a prodrug, which means that it must be further processed in the body before it becomes active, and that's cape cytidine. One of the side effects of cape cytidine is hand foot syndrome. Your palms and your feet become red. They can start blistering. And the last of the pyrimidine inhibitors is cytarabine, uh, which is a rabinose C. It's a DNA chain terminator. Side effect here is conjunctivitis and cerebral neural defects. So ERA-C or cytarabine causes conjunctivitis and cerebral defects. So CCC, ERA-C, conjunctivitis, cerebral neural defects. It's also worth mentioning that cytarabine is the 7 in 7 plus chemotherapy. If you haven't heard of that, it's like a 10-day regimen of chemotherapy that's very common. For the first seven days, you're going to be administering cytarabine, uh, and that's before three days of anthracyclines. We'll talk about anthracyclines in a second. And there's one other class of antimetabolites called the purine analog. And the one that is important to know is 6-mercaptopurine. Easy to remember that as a purine analog, 6-mercaptopurine. So we have three classes of antimetabolites, which is a larger class of chemotherapeutic drugs. We have folate inhibitors, pyrimidine inhibitors, and purine analogs. Now, another class, microtubule targeting agents. These drugs inhibit mitosis. Mitosis, of course, uh, occurs during the M phase. They uh, specifically target the microtubule activity during mitosis. We're going to talk about how they do that. Vinca alkaloids firstly destroy microtubules. Easy to remember. Vinca alkaloids destroy microtubules, and that obviously prevents their function. Three vinca alkaloids are listed here. Blast is underlined. You'll see why in a second. Side effects of vinca alkaloids are peripheral neuropathy and myelosuppression. Blast is the strongest of the of those three in suppressing the uh, the the immune system. So vinblastin is the strongest myelosuppressive chemotherapeutic drug. It has the strongest side effect. One important thing to remember about vinca alkaloids is that you cannot inject them directly into the spine. They are fatal if given intrathecally. Next group of microtubule targeting agents are the taxanes. These stabilize microtubules, which prevent them from doing what they actually need to do, which prevent the microtubules from actually touching the chromosomes and pulling them apart during metaphase. So vinca alkaloids destroy them, taxanes stabilize them. Both render them useless. Two taxanes that are important to know are paclitaxel and docetaxel. Side effect of these are myelosuppression, we're going to be seeing that a lot, and peripheral neuropathies. There's also hypersensitivity associated with these. And it's important to know that the hypersensitivity doesn't come from the drugs, it doesn't come from paclitaxel and docetaxel directly, but rather it comes from the diluents that the drugs are dissolved in. These diluents, cremophore and tween 80, both cause hypersensitivity. The one from paclitaxel, cremophore, is a little more potent. If we don't want to deal with this hypersensitivity, we could also administer a Braxane, uh, which is a different formulation of paclitaxel. It's protein-bound paclitaxel, and it helps us avoid the hypersensitivity that's involved with the cream for diluent in paclitaxel. One of the trade-offs of using a Braxane versus paclitaxel is that you have more neuropathy. So you have less hypersensitivity, but more neuropathy. Next class, topoisomerase inhibitors. There's topoisomerase 1, topoisomerase 2. The ones that inhibit topo 1 prevent the relaxation of supercoiled DNA. Two of these to remember, topotecan and irinotecan. Irinotecan has a fun mnemonic to help you remember what it does. We'll get in that in a second. Both of these cause myelosuppression, like almost everything else we're talking about. Irinotecan causes diarrhea. Easy to remember because irinotecan sounds like I ran to the can. You ran to the can when you have diarrhea, caused by irinotecan. Topo 2 inhibitors prevent recoiling of DNA after transcription. A couple of these to remember are toposide and teniposide, both ending in oside, topoisomerase 2 inhibitors. Both have side effects of myelosuppression, mucositis, and secondary malignancies, such as causing AML, acute myeloid acute myeloblast leukemia. These are the three, four Ms that are associated with TOPO2 inhibitors, such as etoposide and teniposide. 
Next class that we want to talk about are the anthracyclines. Anthracyclines kind of have an ambiguous mechanism of action. They do a bunch of stuff. They could do more than one of these. They could just do a few of these. Some of them are listed here. They can intercalate DNA, which means that they insert themselves between the actual, the two actual strands of DNA, preventing their replication and preventing synthesis of RNA from that DNA. So they intercalate DNA and just inhibit the use of that DNA. They can also inhibit topoisomerase II. One of them, doxorubicin, uh, in particular, inhibits, dox, or inhibits topoisomerase II. They can generate reactive oxygen species that cause oxidative damage to the DNA. And they also might cause alkylation, which, like we saw with the alkylating agents, can cause cross-linking between DNA base pairs and, uh, and essentially render the DNA useless, kind of like intercalation of DNA. Anthracyclines are easy to remember because they all end in rubicin. These are the rubicins, doxorubicin, donorubicin. You can read the rest there. Uh, Ida rubicin and epirubicin. Side effects of these are uh, pretty common to all of them. Biventricular heart failure. And this is based on the dose, the cumulative dose of the rubicin administered. So there's like a limit for each of these rubicins. So doxorubicin's limit might be some number. You can only give a person so much doxorubicin before they hit that number and be at a statistically significant increase risk for biventricular heart failure. One other side effect for the anthracyclines is that they are necrotic with extravasation. This means that if you, when you're normally injecting these into the veins, if you miss the veins and accidentally get some of these anthracycline into the surrounding tissue, they can cause necrosis of that tissue, leave very nasty looking wounds. They could tear up somebody's whole arm, tear up somebody's wrist if you miss when inserting a vein. So nurses are trained really well to, to be very careful about administering anthracyclines. If you want to look up some pictures of this, it looks pretty nasty. It's kind of fun to look at. Uh, you, can, you can look up anthracycline extravasion and it should be pretty easy to find. It's also worth noting that anthracyclines are the three in the aforementioned seven plus three chemotherapy. So you have seven days of cytarabine followed by three days of one of the anthracyclines such as doxorubicin. Next class are the monoclonal antibodies. These are antibodies that are synthesized to a specific target that has been known to inhibit cancer. We'll give you a bit more detail here. The origin of the monoclonal antibodies can be determined from the suffixes. So monoclonal antibodies ending in OMAB come from mice. Or mouse is easier to remember. The O from OMAB, O from mouse. The XIMAB ending, or IMAB, uh, comes from the chimeric antibodies. These chimeric antibodies are a cross between human and mouse. So they have some human in them. This list, by the way, is, is in decreasing order of how much mice is involved in these antibodies. So this UMAB, this next one, is humanized, which means it's about 10% mouse, 90% human. Easy to remember because UMAB has a U in it, just like human. Then finally, the fully human antibodies are called MUMAB. Now these MUMABs are 100% human. So I believe the, the chimeric antibodies are about 33% human. The humanized antibodies are about 10% human and the fully human antibodies, excuse me, the UMAB antibodies are about 10% mouse and the fully human antibodies are about 0% mouse. We have a list of four important monoclonal antibodies that are that are probably worth knowing. Uh, start with rituximab, very commonly used. It targets CD20, which is a receptor very common to B cells. It's used to treat lymphomas or the abnormal proliferation of B cells that you often see in lymphomas. And we're not gonna we're not gonna be discussing the toxicity for the first two, but target CD20 used for lymphomas. There's another one used for breast cancer, targets HER2, also not as, not as significant. Cetuximab targets the EGFR receptor, endothelial growth factor receptor. This is uh, used to treat solid tumors and it was initially developed to treat colorectal cancer. One of the side effects of cetuximab is that you get hypersensitivity in the form of an acniform rash. So it looks like you have dots all over your skin, you get a rash if you use cetuximab. Another one that's worth knowing is beza, bevacizumab, which uh, targets VEGF, which is a vascular endothelial growth factor, also used for solid tumors, um, initially developed for colorectal and lung cancers. This is a problem because it can cause GI perforation. VEGF is a factor that promotes angiogenesis, promotes the growth of, of blood vessels into new parts of the body or into tumors. If you inhibit those, you can weaken the GI tract and cause perforation 
of the GI tract. And finally, we're gonna have a short list of other chemotherapeutic agents. Bleomycin is worth noting because it causes lung toxicity, just like the, the ones related to mustard gas that we talked about earlier, the nitrosoureas. Bleomycin also causes lung toxicity. Side effects of this lung toxicity include pulmonary fibrosis, interstitial pneumonitis, and hypersensitivity pneumonitis, which includes cough or having infiltrates in the lungs. And there are a couple other hormonal therapies that are worth knowing. Some of these are for breast cancer, specifically the anti-estrogens, such as tamoxifen and the aromatase inhibitors. Aromatase, I don't think I have any examples here, but they block the synthesis of estrogen. Actually, there are a couple examples ending in ozol. So the one that's important to know is the anti-estrogen tamoxifen. There are also some hormonal therapies for prostate cancer, such as the anti-androgens, and there should be a small list of these, like the LH, RH antagonists, or excuse me, LHRH agonists, the GNRH antagonists, and the CYP17 inhibitors. And if you look up the production of testosterone, you can kind of see how these three subclasses of antiandrogens all kind of inhibit testosterone production in a different way, all with the eventual goal of preventing androgen stimulation of prostate cancer. So these are other chemotherapeutic agents that didn't really fit into the other categories. This has been a brief review of chemotherapy agents. I hope it was helpful and I hope it was a good, a good introduction to, to commonly used drugs and their mechanisms of actions and side effects. Thanks for listening.